You're listening to Community Radio, CKMS, Radio Waterloo, 102.7, 946 on the Rogers Digital Network. Happy Monday, Waterloo. It is Monday, the 30th of November, the last day for NaNoWriMo. Get your word count in now. If you're listening to Community Connections, my name is Bob Jonkman. We have some new music today. And author Chuck Howitt, author of Blackberry Town, will be uh, in the studio. We'll be chatting with him in just a bit. Right now, listening to Take It by Invertigo. for me Take It by Invertigo. Not exactly new music. Keaton from the band wrote and said, Hi, I'm Keaton, drummer for the hard rock band Invertigo based out of Calgary, Alberta. We're hot off winning the CJAY92 Battle of the Bands competition and are planning to tour down to your neck of the woods, that would be KW, as well as a tour to the USA for the first time this summer. 
Now, when Keaton says this summer, he actually meant last summer because that's how old this email is that I finally dug out of the bottom of my email box. Keaton writes, we have already sent our EP Sex and Love and Chaos to your station. I'm following up to see if you spun it yet. Well, now we have. Think if Guns N' Roses and Soundgarden were having sweaty, nasty, awesome sex. Well, that's what uh, In Vertical sounds like. Thank you, Keaton, for writing and submitting music. And if you've got a band and you want to submit some music, write to office at radiowaterloo.ca and it'll get into our music rotation, hopefully not as long as a year from now. I have in the studio, Chuck Howitt. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Bob. Thanks for having me. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to Community Connections. I'm glad you came in. Glad to be here. Yeah. You're, um, you're a former journalist with the record. The, yes, our, that's correct. Yeah. Our local newspaper. Right. Yeah. And an author. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I wrote a book uh, called Blackberry Town. It came mm -hmm. out in the fall of 2019. And basically, just to tell you a little bit more about how the book came into being, I was a longtime reporter and editor at the Waterloo Region Record newspaper. Started there in 1979, and through most of the 1980s, I was local news reporter, covered city hall, school board, the courts. And then in the late 1980s, I, I wanted to change. I moved on to the copy desk at the record where I stayed for 15 years. Eventually, I became assistant city editor. So my focus was mostly local news, not really paying any attention to business news. Mm -hmm. I'd never really been much interested in business. I don't know why, but I always found it kind of boring. And then in around 2005, I was looking for a change, wanted to go back on to reporting, and I asked our managing editor if I could go back on the reporting staff. So she went away, Melinda Marks was her name, and came back and said, we have an opening on the business team. Would you like to cover business? And I, and I thought, first business? I, and I was kind of surprised. I said, I have no experience covering business. Not sure I would want to do that. It just kind of came out of left field. Yeah. And she said, uh, well, uh, that's the only opening we have. <laughs> Take it or leave it. So I spoke to the business editor, Kevin Crowley, at the time. And uh, he said, you can learn as you go. It's okay. I think you're good enough. You can pick it up as, as you go along. Journalism is, is journalism, no matter what. We yeah, do. Isn't yeah. That right? He seemed to be think I could do the job. So in I went, and he coached me in the early days. He gave me files on how to cover a quarterly release and background stuff like that, you know, like for a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. So in I went in 2005, the fall of 2005, covering business at the record. And it kind of, um, it turned out to be a fortuitous move for me because it kind of opened up a new world for me. I found I quite enjoyed covering business once I yeah. had a chance to look around and see what was going on. And um, one of the, uh, I kind of did a whole bunch of supplementary reading. I started reading bios of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Steve Jobs <laughs> and kind of woke up to that whole area of news. And of course, when I looked around at the local companies, the biggest company and the most exciting company, uh, you know, locally was Research in Motion. 2005, they were number one. They were the toast uh -huh. of the Canadian business scene, the international business scene, Wall Street, and it was right in our backyard. And I, you know, I was aware of RIM prior to that. You know, you couldn't help but know what was yeah. going on. I mean, but I'd never really taken the time to really take a close look at what they were doing. And when I did, you know, I was really blown away. I thought, wow, this is <laughs> this company's amazing what they've accomplished. And so I really became fascinated with what they were up to. And and um, I I didn't. I wasn't covering RIM right off the, the bat. Uh, another reporter was the lead RIM reporter, and I'll get to him a bit later, but okay. he was a new guy too. So I was kind of back up. There were four of us covering business at that time. So, uh, But I had to be ready to jump in on a moment's notice if the regular RIM guy was not available. So occasionally I'd be called upon to cover 
uh, research in motion, like a quarterly release or breaking news story. So I had to sort of be up on what they were doing. So, uh, and as far as the book goes, I, I had always wanted to write a book. Most journalists will tell you that that's one of their dreams when they get into the business, eventually writing a book. It's kind of like the progression, you know, moving up the ladder, but most never really do get to do that. It's kind of a dream, but um, I, as the, the time went on, I realized, you know, here's a big international story. Um, it's happening right in our backyard. There's a book opportunity here. Now, um, so, so you started planning Blackberry Town as long ago as 2005? Uh, not really, but it was in the back of my mind. Basically, what happened was um, in 2009, we kind of had a layoff at the record because of the recession. Mm -hmm. And the lead rim guy was a younger guy. He was let go. He, he went to Bloomberg in Toronto. His name was Matt Walkoff. So I was put on the rim beat. So I was covering it for the record, all the you know big stories. And then I started to think, this is a, a real book opportunity. Uh, and a lot of people don't get this opportunity because they don't get to cover a story like this. Um, you know, it, it's such a big story, and I'm right there covering it. So, there yeah, was, there it's... Was, there was enough business yeah. happening in Waterloo Region yeah. that it took two journalists from uh, from the records to cover it. Uh, Matt for all the rim stuff, yeah. and then you for everything else. Well, there were four business reporters four. at that time. Four. And yeah, now there's two. We cut back. But, yeah, mm -hmm. there was... The record had a much bigger staff then. We had... I counted it up at one point, and it's in the book, like 35 reporters, 33 to 35 reporters across all the beats, wow. including yeah. sports, arts. Yeah. Now it's like a dozen, yeah. but one-third. How <clears> far <throat> does the news gathering go? And when do you collide with other journalists from other jurisdictions? Uh, the records coverage area? Yeah. Yeah, it used to. We used to cover uh, right up to um, Southampton, Places like oh, yeah. that along the lake shore. Yeah, we had our summer readership, uh, Walkerton, okay. Hanover. Okay. We had correspondence up in all those areas. But our main coverage area is Waterloo Region. We used to cover Guelph, but they've cut back on that. Um, Waterloo Region and points north, not so much south, you know. So, because okay. south would be covered by the spectator. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, as far as the RIM story goes, I continued to cover RIM up until 2013. And I, that kind of coincided with RIM's sort of fall. They, 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 uh, the story of the book, in the book I tell the story of the rise and fall, but I covered mostly the fall of RIM because <laughs> from, around, from 2005 on, things started to go downhill, particularly with the iPhone, 2007, the Android phones, about a year or two later. So I, from 9 to 13, when I was lead reporter, it was kind of a, a you know, RIM was really starting to lose its um, grip on the market. Um, in the book, I quote Randall Howard, who's a local tech um, investor mm -hmm. and um, uh, writer, and he, called, he described it as a train wreck in slow motion, RIM slide into, you know, where it is now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I covered that period. And then in 2013, I took a buyout from the record. I just turned 60 and decided if I'm going to write a book, it's now or never. Yeah. So really that's when I started writing, working on the book, uh, cause I had a pension. And so basically, um, yeah, the book took six years from start to finish. Yeah. Part of the problem was I didn't have a deadline and a publisher at the beginning. <laughs> so I, other things intervened. I'd work on a way on it. But if somebody said, do you want to go play golf? I'd go and play golf. Or, yeah. or if my wife said, it's time for a vacation, off we went. And, you know. So with the ideas percolating through your head for that long, does that yeah. increase the quality of the writing or does it just procrastination and you don't get anything done? No, I, I was quite determined that I was going to write this book. And I, and I did when I was available, which was a good part of the time, did work on it. I, you know, basically um, set up a whole bunch of interviews, did mm -hmm. background reading. I had kept a file on um, 
major stories that had happened over the years at RIM, several files. I even had files of people who were leaving RIM up until then. Oh, I thought these would be good people to talk to. I had a whole long list of people to interview. And I started interviewing. I read back issues of the record in the Globe to get the main uh, events of RIM's uh, story. And I actually read through quarterly um, um, uh, conference calls. You can get those online of RIM's quarterly releases. Really? A lot of good information in there. Yeah, because every quarter RIM would release its results and Jim Balzilli would do a conduct, re, uh, highlight the events of the quarter. Mm -hmm. The finance guy would come on, um, was Dennis Cavillman, and then after that, I forget, who would do the highlight, the finances, and then they'd open up the call to questions from analysts, and he'd give a lot of good information in those calls. And I had covered many of them and written news stories, but there was a lot of detail in those um, transcripts, which I photocopied, read through, and was able to pull uh, some good information out of their timelines of when things happen, what they were doing. And so I had all that as well in preparation to work on the book. And is, is it legislated that a corporation has to publish uh, those transcripts or was it just BlackBerry being kind? I believe they do have to publish those transcripts. Any publicly traded company, um, I don't know for sure, but uh, th those transcripts were available, yes, from BlackBerry. So there could be a whole bunch of other good stories yeah. out there that just need somebody to mine it out. And I've still got the transcripts at home in a filing cabinet. Ah. My wife keeps saying, when are you going to get rid of all that stuff? <laughs> I can't part with it just yet. I don't know. I might well, need it. <laughs> BlackBerry is not down and out yet, right? They've, yeah. Uh, there's a, a potential comeback because right. they're, they're getting into other businesses now. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example of how it came in handy, that transcript. Uh -huh. So at one point in the book, I tell the story of Jim Balzilli being interviewed by um, Malcolm Gladwell. It was 2007. Uh -huh. It was a special conference on the workplace of tomorrow. So Gladwell and Balzilli had known each other back at U of T. They were old friends. Right. Strange, but true. Uh -huh. So anyway, during the, so Gladwell's interviewing Balzilli. There's a an audience at UW of students. And so they're going along talking and, and um, he's asked, Gladwell asks Balzilli about the competition. And this was around the time the iPhone came out. So um, Jim Balzilli is talking about the competition, but he won't say the, the word iPhone. Uh -huh. So finally Gladwell confronts him and says, you're allowed to say it, Jim. You know, and so finally he says, yeah, the iPhone and da, da, da. So I was able to look in the transcripts for just prior to that. Jim Balzilli had, during a conference call, had talked about the iPhone, made some disparaging remarks about, you know, it's not a contest between who has the funkiest device. It's the one that works best. So yeah. I, I was able to weave all that into that story, right. that anecdote. So there's a case where the transcripts really came in handy. Right. So, anyway. And, and BlackBerry would still be publishing those because you know, they're still in business. They should still be available. Um, I haven't checked lately, yeah. but yeah, there's still a publicly traded company with quarterly releases. Okay. The record has kind of stopped covering a lot of that stuff. Um, I think, I don't know why, yeah. but. I guess spectacular rises are good news and spectacular yeah. falls are good news. And then a company that just kind of chugs along doesn't, yeah. uh, doesn't make it to the front pages. No, no, no. But um, anyway, yeah, I kept a lot of that stuff and, you know, that helped me get started on, on writing the book. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, as I went along, um, so I started interviewing and I was doing some writing and then another book came out in 2015 called Losing the Signal mm -hmm. uh, by two reporters from the Globe and Mail. So I had, once I had a look at that book and I knew it was coming, I'd, I'd been tipped off that this was coming, I almost abandoned my book because uh, there, it was quite a good book and they got access to uh, Mike Lazarus and Jim Balzilli mm -hmm. and they told their story in that book. So um, once I'd read the book, I took a few months off, but then I, I thought, um, no, I don't want to give up on my project. I've spent too much time on it. Um, I'm going to have take another run at it. Um, 
I, I kind of compare it to writing a book and sometimes be be like pushing a boulder up a hill. It's, it's a it's a you know an yeah. onerous task, and you, sometimes you want to just give up. But the flip side of that is um, it can be a rock to hold on to because I was retired and didn't have anything else going on in my life at that time. And I thought, well, what else am I going to do? Play golf or yeah. I, it was something to do. It was like a rock yeah. to hold on to. So writing is in your blood, in your bones. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it was a, a focus for yeah. me. So I, I pressed on and um, decided to turn the book into a memoir of covering rim of my experiences covering the company and a couple other reporters okay. at the record. And I, I tell the rim story as well, because there were a number of events that I covered, interviews with uh, Mike Lazaridis, cor uh, annual meetings, um, other events that I could use okay. in the book. So I finished the book um, in uh, 2018. I had 80,000 words, and, and then I tried to find a publisher. So um, I kind of went at the book backwards. Like normally when you're writing a, a book, you draw up an outline maybe a couple mm -hmm. sample chapters, try to find a publisher. And if you can't, you either give up on it or you go into self-publishing. Yeah. I wrote my whole manuscript and then tried to find a publisher. Um, Cause I was worried I, 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 at the beginning, I maybe I'm not sure I can write 80,000 words or finish the book. So I don't want to go to a publisher and say, here's my plan. And they say, okay, go ahead. And then I, <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. But so anyway, I went in it backwards, started making the rounds of publishers and agents. And that's, it takes a while too, because you have to make pitches and email and follow all their protocols. And so I got, I probably contacted a, a 20 different, 10 different publishers, 10 different agents. There was about 20 in there and that took months of work. Yeah. And I got a few tire kickers, uh, publishers and agents who wanted to see the manuscript, but no takers in the end. So then I was figuring I'm going to have to self-publish. But then I remembered a guy I know named Steve Isma. And uh, Steve yeah. used to work at WLU Press. Uh -huh. I know Steve. And you know, <laughs> of course you know Steve. <laughs> so I figured I, Steve was a friend of a friend. He might be able to help me. He would be my quasi-agent. So I contacted Steve, and uh, he had a look at the manuscript, took a couple weeks to go over it, and then he got back to me and said, this might work for Lorimer, a Toronto nonfiction book publisher. Mm -hmm. So he spoke to Jim Lorimer, the owner of the company on my behalf, and Jim emailed me and said, send me the manuscript. So I sent it to him, and then he had a look and got back to me about a month later. He says, I like what you've got here. Uh, I think there's potential, but we need to make a, a bunch, a lot of changes. Are you okay with that? So then I thought, okay. And so then we went through a number of meetings on Skype. He was in Toronto or Halifax. Mm -hmm. I've never met him face to face. Ah. <laughs> so they have two offices. Their printing press is in Halifax and their main corporate office is Toronto. Okay. So finally we came up with an outline that he was happy with. And he wanted me to sort of broaden the canvas of the story beyond just the rim story to talk about the impact on the community of Blackberry and the some of the other companies in the Waterloo tech sector, mm -hmm. hence the title Blackberry Town. Right. So we came up with that uh, outline and a new title. And then they gave me an incredibly short <laughs> deadline to make all this happen. Like they gave me seven months. I signed a contract. Okay. September 2018 with a March 31st, 2019 deadline. So I'm thinking, whoa, this is a quick, because I had to interview a bunch of new people and write a bunch of new chapters. I'd say two thirds okay. of the book was new based on what he wanted. And here's the irony of this. I, I pushed him for more time. I said, I can't meet this deadline. It's too ambitious and uh, I, w I need more time. And he, I said, I, how about the fall of 2019? And so he came back and said, okay, if, if that's going to be your deadline, it won't come out till the spring of 2020. And we all know what happened in 2020. Uh -huh. yes, yes. So pandemic. So he said, I kind of thought, 
And my wife said, you got to finish this book. Stop asking for more time. <laughs> so I, I agreed to his initial deadline. And fortunately, I'm so thankful that I did. Because I, it came out in the fall of 2019, six months before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So I was able to get a lot of sales before the yeah, pandemic. Yeah. Doing, going out and doing the book tour, book signings, yes, uh, introductions. Yes, I did. I had six months uh, of promotion, which I did. Right. A good launch, interviews. I went to bookstores. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so it, it worked out well for me in that regard. Yeah. But. So as a journalist, did the deadline help you having some yes. pressure there? Well, I should I can tell you about the process I went through in that seven months. I probably interviewed 35 more people from September till December. That's almost three interviews a week. And you have to prep for these interviews. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't record them because I thought there's no way I can do transcripts. I didn't hire anybody else. So I took notes. And then I started writing before Christmas, and I wrote until right to the deadline. And I was writing seven days a week, um, not 12 hours a day. I found with the writing process, I needed to be well-rested. So okay. I would get up in the morning, uh, after sit down with quick breakfast, then I'd write till about noon. Then I'd take a break in the afternoon. I might write in the evening. I, I, I do this on Saturday. Sometimes I wrote in the afternoon. Um, but I, I was writing pretty much every day. Uh, I had my outline. And as long as I was well rested, I found I kind of went out at a two or three hour spurts. Okay. And then a, like a, a break in the afternoon, back in the evening. Yeah. And uh, I got it done. Like, yeah. But the book is, is substantially different from a personal account of, of the journalist and that took place at the record. Yes, it, it is. It didn't read like that. Uh, it's, um, well, I, I must, I, I'm grateful for to Jim Lorimer because I feel it's a better book than the manuscript I originally wrote. Okay. Uh, I was reluctant to make the changes. We butted heads a lot, but it, it is a better book in the end. And he said, the first thing you have to do is take yourself out of the story. It's not about you. It's about Rim, Waterloo, okay. and the tech sector. So it's a, yeah, I believe it's a better book. It's, and he said, the other thing we have to do is make it different from the other Rim books. It has to be unique. And so by talking about the impact on, on KW and the other companies, that's what makes it different. And it also, the, I tried to approach the BlackBerry story because I couldn't get the top guys. I interviewed a lot of grassroots people right rank and file so it's told through their right. eyes as much as didn't get interview opportunities with Belcilio Lazaridis I approached them several times and they they said no or just ignored my yeah. requests yeah yeah were they expecting to be um, decimated yeah. by by your book or were they afraid of, of exposure well it's not a good news story what happened to rim in the end so uh, they you yeah. know so they were reluctant to talk they mm -hmm. basically the only people they've talked to are the two authors of Losing the Signal. So, okay. And I use that as a reference. So my approach was you don't have to read the other books. And there's yeah. three other main books on RIM to follow the RIM story. I've read them all. I called what I thought were the most important parts, put them in my book. So it's like a one-stop shopping. Yeah. You can read my book. And if you really want to get into it, go to the other books. But... It, it's a good, easy read. You know, yeah. I, I, uh, I finished it in, in about uh, three trips on the train, you know, coming, uh, coming here to the station on the train. It takes, takes about an hour. So it took yeah. me, me about three hours to read the, uh, the book in its entirety. Oh, really? So a good, easy read. Yeah. And it's not exactly a history book, is it? No, it's, there's some history in it, but it's, um, yeah, I tried to make it, write it in such a way, and this is my journalism background, so you don't have to be a real business buff yeah. to enjoy it. It's really about people and stories and technology. It, it's, yeah, I wanted it to, to read smoothly and not be too dense. It had to be, so it's a, it's a mix of some history, but some of the chapters are like the chapter on the think tanks, for example, there's live interviews where I talk about how I interviewed... Uh, 
the guy who runs uh, the perimeter, uh, Michael Duchene. Yeah, <laughs> my memory is not as good. And um, uh, Rohinton um, Medora, who runs CG, mm -hmm. those came out just as I interviewed them. Uh, so they're more live. Um, so it, it, the writing style varies depending on what the topic okay. is. Yeah. It seemed, it seemed fairly consistent, and I, I yeah. really did appreciate the details on things like the stock options um, yeah. stuff that, that was happening, because you know, yeah. I have no business mind, so it was good to have right. an explanation in front of me. Yeah. Can you detail that a little bit more? What, what happened with the stock options for RIM? So the stock options, uh, RIM, uh, it, stock options are a common way for uh, tech companies to reward their employees in the early days when they don't have a ton of revenues, although RIM was doing quite well after the BlackBerry came out. But so they give them options to purchase stock at a certain price, but the, the stock doesn't vest until maybe five years down the road. Mm -hmm. So the hope is that the stock will go up. So when the stocks vest, uh, you get to buy the stock at say 10 bucks when the stock is worth $50. Right. So you buy the stock at the price that you yeah, the, at the, the option. option. Yes. Yeah. So you're instantly uh, worth a lot of money on more money on paper. Right. So RIM would hand out stock options to a lot of new employees. Typically they, well, they use them to bring people in to recruit them and then to reward them for a job well done. Right. Now, uh, another thing that was seen to be common then with publicly traded companies, this is in Wall Street, was companies were starting to backdate the options. So this is where RIM got into trouble. They weren't the only company that did it. So according to Canadian law, you could, when you um, awarded an option, there was a, like a, first there was a 40 day window and then it was narrowed to a 10-day window where you could pick the the date that where the stock was the lowest. And right. then you'd say, okay, here's your option price, strike price. So uh, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. You're so, so that just maximized the difference yeah. between the, um, the vesting value and, yeah. and the purchase value. It gives value. you more money. Yes. And, and if it, there's enough options, it can be worth quite a bit. But perfectly legal. Yeah, it was, um, but not the backdating part. So you're supposed to, once the board approves the option, it should be on that date, like not um, okay. on three weeks earlier when the, the price was lower. It, right. it has right. to be done above board. So this became an issue in the United States because the, the thinking is shareholders are hurt by this. If you're giving more money to employees, it's not up front. Um, uh. So it became, it broke as an issue in the U.S. and RIM it, became, it got a lot of headlines in the U.S., and this was around 2004, 5, and 6. Um, RIM, to get ahead of it, because they knew they were doing it, was they announced we're doing our own internal probe of our stock option granting uh, process. And um, so this is kind of where um, the record kind of got in trouble with RIM because our reporter, Matt Wolkoff, did some really good investigative work and determined that RIM was guilty of backdating options. So they came out with their, when their uh, probe came out, they admitted, yeah, we were backdating options and they had to take um, a write down on their earnings of $250 million. That's okay. how much wasn't in the books for the backdating. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so, and Jim Balzilli and Mike Lazaridis had to forfeit options worth like 80 million dollars they they hadn't uh, uh it's not like money they had in the bank they just couldn't exercise the options so right and yeah so it was got, kind of a they got to keep the options but not at the true value no they had to get, give them up oh, so that was a, a okay. an earnings loss for them on paper really and this was around 2007 2009 yeah the the the, the sec and um the ts um um Canadian uh, Securities, I forget the name of the body, yeah. uh, investigated them and, and RIM was fined over this, about $90 million, yeah, in okay. forfeited options. And, yeah, so yeah. I, I think of, of RIM as, you know, a, 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 back in those days, a company with um, infinite amounts of, of, of money. Would yeah. a $90 million fine have been substantial to them? No, no. <laughs> uh, well, they did, their annual revenues got up to $20 billion, so... <clears throat> 
you can see uh, what kind of impact yeah. it had. Like, uh, like there was a bigger issue that cost them quite a bit of money, and that was their ongoing patent struggle with yes. NTP. Yeah. That ended up costing them six hundred million. So, and and then after they announced the settlement of that deal, their stock went up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was it, almost. It replaced. seems to me that that uh, Jim Lazaridis developed the. Uh, technology behind the BlackBerry, um, Mike completely. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Mike. Yeah. Uh, completely independently from uh, from anybody else. Yeah. And so NTP, which you know has been described as as a file drawer in an office. Yes. Uh, is is the classic case of a patent troll, a company that exists only to sue for alleged patent infringement. Well, I kind of say in the book that I don't believe they were a troll because the guy who uh, founded NTP was actually working in wireless mm -hmm. um, prior when in RIM's early days. Um, so he was uh, did some work and had companies in Chicago and Miami. He actually did a wireless um, um, device or something for the Miami Police Department, mm -hmm. and then he kind of um, he ended up going bankrupt. Uh, he lost a major company, uh, customer, sorry. Yeah. And uh, so he had to declare bankruptcy. And he, so he had done a fair amount of work. Then he thought I should file patents for my work because I think, um, uh, you know, I should be compensated yeah. for this uh, technology. So he filed his patents before RIM brought out the BlackBerry. So really, I'm not sure he was a patent troll. RIM kind of messed up because they really should have settled with oh, them. Oh, RIM, RIM certainly messed up. But, yeah. but the technology that, that was developed at RIM was done completely independently was. of anything that, that um, he had developed. So yeah. there was no, there was no um, use of their technology to be licensed. No, it was no. just, you know, parallel evolution of, of similar ideas. It's the and, unfortunate way the patent laws were set yeah. up. Yeah, so, yes, I, yeah, RIM did, they, they didn't, steal any of his technology. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. And yet we're still made to pay license fees for something that they weren't actually using. Right, yeah. And it could be argued that that was one of the distractions that um, that RIM was sort of busy with mm -hmm. and when they could have been working, putting more resources into improving the BlackBerry yeah. around that time. It was a critical yeah. time. But that patent infringement lawsuit uh, that RIM lost yeah. Um, didn't take them down either. No, no, uh, it didn't. Although it dragged on for about five years, strangely. Yeah. Uh, I remember it, it being big news around 1999, uh, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Uh, well, the patent lawsuit was actually settled in 2006, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah so it, it did drag on yeah, for yeah, a long yeah. time then. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what took BlackBerry down? What, what was it that uh, made BlackBerry no longer the go-to device? Uh, well, I always have been asked this question many times, but I think it was a combination of factors and I kind of divide them into two categories, inside the company and outside the company. So inside the company, I think they got a bit complacent. They, um, they were number one, the BlackBerry was the biggest selling device on the planet, um, mostly among business people. And uh, they, they thought they were, I think RIM got a bit arrogant and um, complacent. There was less urgency to try anything new and radical. And um, one thing that lulled them to sleep a bit was they had had a number of other companies take runs at them to try to knock off the BlackBerry, including Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And RIM had fended, this went on for about the previous five or six years. And RIM had fended them all off. So they figured, we're, we're pretty good. We can take on anybody. So they got lulled to sleep. Another problem was, I'd say, the distractions. Um, you know, Mike Lazarius had his Perimeter Institute. Jim Balzilli had CG. Um, Jim Balzilli was trying to buy an NHL team. Yes. Uh, so stuff like that was going on. Um, I like to use a quote from... I interviewed Dave Jaworski at one point, the Waterloo mayor. Uh -huh. He wouldn't go on the record, but I asked him about that. And he said, what we, where we went wrong was you have to put yourself out of business. And what he meant was you have to have a, a group inside the company, research group, trying to come up with new devices to put right. your BlackBerry out of business, make something right. better. 
RIM didn't really have that. They were only taking incremental steps and improving the BlackBerry. So that's the stuff. That partly the constraints of the technology they they yeah. developed in the first place, which was never really yeah. meant to go as far as as you know a, a smart device that everybody has in their pocket. It was right. meant for getting your email remotely. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other problem was there were a couple of problems on the technology side. Their operating system was kind of old. They yeah. needed to have a new OS, and they build a new one. They were still using the same OS as what the original BlackBerry was based on. And secondly, the processing power to do what the iPhone did didn't even exist in 2004 and 5. That's, That's right. how much it was changing. When the iPhone came out, the processors powering that device were only brand new. They had only just gotten powerful enough to do that. So, you know, it was kind of a time when a lot of things were changing quickly and it was, you know, it was hard to keep up. But I... As far as outside the company goes, there was a competition coming on, like Apple, Google, some pretty tough competition. All of a sudden, decided yeah. they wanted to get into mobile. Yeah. And that was... RIM had a narrow window where they could have stayed in the race, I would say, from 2007 to 10, where they needed a new device that could do all the stuff that the iPhone could do, and they needed it out there then. They didn't get it out in time. Yeah. Microsoft tried to be a player in that game as well, and you know didn't last no. as long as as uh, they Mark failed Mary. as well yeah. on mobile. The yeah. difference is um, they had other stuff to fall back on, yes. which reminds me of another point, <laughs> if I if I may. Mike Lazaridis used to always say as a strength for Rem that why they would succeed is he said this is all we do is smartphones meaning that other companies have a, are into a bunch right. of different things. So they're, you know, they're trying to do too many things at once. Yeah. Um, it turns out that ended up being a liability because I believe that Apple could draw from its desktop experience with the Mac and stuff and the iPod to put into the iPhone. Google could draw from its search engine apps experience mm -hmm. to put into the Android phones. So, being versatile and doing other things ended up being a strength, not a weakness. Yeah. So for RIM, it was a weakness. Yeah, I was using Blackberries um, around 2005, 2006, before mm -hmm. um, some of the fancier stuff came out. And to me, it seemed like it was um, largely a, 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 a web browser and, and, and some other devices bolted onto a telephone. There was really no integration in, in the device. Interesting. And so, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and the other thing that, that, that strikes me that that's, I don't know if it really was something that affected their uh, their ability to survive in the business world, but they kept such tight control over access to the system. You know, they did not open up the uh, devices for um, third-party app development, for example. So they lost a, no. a whole bunch of of that market to uh, iPhone initially and Android a little bit later. Yes, and. From a corporate point of view, um, I went on a, a BlackBerry Enterprise Server training course, oh, and yeah. even though corporations had these servers on their premises to, you know, manage the infrastructure for the Blackberries themselves, the the signals, the uh, the processing still went through headquarters at BlackBerry. So, you know, right. uh, in, yeah. For one thing, I'm not so sure what that did for security. You know, did that provide um, a backdoor into uh, encrypted, allegedly encrypted uh, communications. Right. And it also gave BlackBerry the power to shut down corporations. You know, they weren't mm -hmm. actually independent in their, in their communications. And I, I, mm -hmm. I can't see that there were enough large companies mm -hmm. that considered that a liability and would have switched to other technologies to be able to bring stuff in-house. Right, yeah, that um, uh, initially was viewed as a strength, but then it mm -hmm. became a weakness when th there was the whole movement of bring your own device to work uh, uh, movement, yeah. where it, which started with the iPhone. And, and yeah, and it, it came to a head when uh, the government of India refused to allow Blackberries for use there. Yeah, yeah, um, yes, they ran into, um, well, it was the whole issue of uh, Blackberry. Uh, or India wanted to see, have control over what their citizens are doing. Exactly. So they wanted to see their email, and BlackBerry said no. That became a big issue in a number of countries, yeah. But eventually, BlackBerry <clears throat> acceded to those demands, you know, allowed 
the yeah. service to to exist in uh, within the boundaries of, of the Indian government. Right. And then that opened up the whole idea that if if India is now satisfied, they can you know mm -hmm. examine the contents of these messages. What does that do for all the other corporate messaging that's out there? Is that equally vulnerable? Yeah, yeah, it's um, interesting point. I it's one I didn't get into in, in any great yeah. depth, but yeah, you would have experience with the, the uh, Bez with City of Toronto yeah. when you yeah, were there. Yeah, City of Toronto, exactly. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it was interesting, and, and you know, I pointed that out to uh, to City of Toronto management, but it it wasn't a, a, right. a black strike against BlackBerry. They implemented the Bez and you know carried on yeah. quite nicely for a few more years after that. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, I think because they were number one and they had control of the market and were yeah. seen to be doing well, people didn't want to mess with, with them. And Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You brought some excerpt with you, something uh, to, to share with our radio audience. Yes, yeah. Would you like me to read a few of them? Sure. Um, can you set this up? Yeah, so the first one is... Um, uh, I call it rolling up the rim, winning. Um, this one is kind of connected to the stock option business. So this is just, um, these are short excerpts. Um, uh, this is a guy interviewed and used a lot in some of the, in one of the early chapters of uh, Pete Gould was hired to sell blackberries in, in the United States. So here's a quote from Pete. Just a second now. Uh, Pete Gould would get an email from RIM Payroll telling him his stock option check had arrived. When he went to pick it up, envelopes were laid out like Christmas cards on a display case for himself and other employees. When you open up the envelope and get a, see a six-figure check with your name on it, it's pretty frickin' incredible feeling. So that's a quick uh, inter excerpt from uh, Pete. Uh, this one is... In the book, um, I also talk about other companies in the Waterloo Tech sector, and one of them is Open Text. Um, so Open Text um, uh, developed a search engine. It, Open Text course came from uh, what the University of Waterloo won a contract to dig digitize the Oxford English Dictionary, and they came up with a, a search engine to search the dictionary database, and from that, they formed the company Open Text, and they also built, using that knowledge, one of the first search engines on the internet. So this is um, an excerpt from that part. Rumors were starting to circulate about an exciting new thing called the World Wide Web. At a conference in the fall of 1994, Tim Bray, one of the founders of Open Text, heard a speech about the coming web and the need for search technology to find data on it. His mind started racing. Could open text search engine be the answer? It could crawl and parse. The only missing piece was a web server. It could all be done and it wouldn't be that complicated. I got so excited that I was physically shaking on and off for the next three days. Um, and here's another, would you like me to do a? Sure, go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, another company I focused on was um, Pickstream. Uh, they were, the reason I did was because they became, this is a local Waterloo Tech company, I, what I would call the Canadian poster child for the dot-com mania of the late 90s, oh, early 2000s. Yes. <laughs> they were acquired by Cisco for 500 million, 550 million Canadian. Um, and they were just a little company like four, four years earlier. They were only four years old. They made video that could be transmitted over phone lines. Um, and onto computers and stuff. So they they had a technology that all of a sudden investors thought would be really important and could go viral. So um, yeah, uh, just a second now. Okay, so this um, excerpt is so what happened was Cisco bought Pickstream. And then four months later, they shut, shut it down because of the dot-com uh -huh. bubble burst. So it was kind of a devastating blow for the company. That's why the story is so interesting. So here's the uh, excerpt. Uh, later that day, Dave Caputo, the CEO, went for a walk 
with his two children to find some peace amid all the turmoil. This was the day they were told Cisco was shutting them down. So it felt like the worst day of his life. His cell phone rang. On the line was Terry Matthews, the venture capital investor who had originally invested in the company. After commiserating with the embattled Pickstream boss, his tone changed. Dave, you got to start another company. You can't let everyone scatter to the four corners of the earth. Caputo was taken aback. But Terry, I just fire, fired all my engineers today. Well, you've got their frickin' phone numbers, don't you? <laughs> so that's... Uh... <laughs> That actually ended up being a success story, you know. Out of the uh, out of the ashes of um, uh, BlackBerry yes. came a, a number of phoenixes that uh, that did really well in in Waterloo. Right. Yeah. Well, that one Pickstream that sort of happened independent of BlackBerry. They um, built another company called Sandvine. Mm -hmm. which was into internet uh, equipment for internet service providers mm -hmm. and became quite a successful company. They're still around today, although they were purchased. Um, they now have a, a foreign owner. Uh, they, they ended up being sold a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, there was kind of a BlackBerry diaspora. I talk about it at the end of the book where former RIM people left and either started other companies or uh, went to work for other companies and helped build other companies. So that's kind of a silver lining from the BlackBerry story. It's, a, it's funny that the Pickstream company ended up becoming Sandvine because there's another company, Digero, that's doing video streaming now. Yes. And uh, they're pretty big in that field. And Northern Digital for uh, medical uh, imaging devices yeah. is, is pretty big in the uh, area here too. Right, yeah, there's, that's one of the good, nice things about the Waterloo tech sector is there's quite a variety and diversity in the number of companies. Mm -hmm. it, the one thing that's missing, I feel now, is the one big anchor company like an Apple or a, a Google to really anchor the company. And um, so there's a bunch of other companies, but they're not really well known. Mm -hmm. We have a few new unicorns, they call them. Companies <laughs> valued at more than a billion, uh, but they're all sort of privately owned. And right. so you don't see their finances very easily. And I think the unicorn is a bit of a, a, a mirage in a way because they're worth that on paper. But exactly. what are their revenues yeah. or sales really? You know? yeah. So yeah. it's really they've attracted investment money. Would anybody actually pay those billions of dollars to acquire a company yeah. like that? You know, yeah. Possibly. Stranger things have happened. But uh, so it shows there's a lot of potential in the region for other companies to really grow into something, but it hasn't happened really yet on the order of RIM. Like OpenText is still the largest, most successful software company in the region still. Yes. And BlackBerry is still around. And uh, there's some other, you know, companies as well. So it's doing pretty well. It, it punches above its yeah. weight, I believe. And now that the book is done, you know, you've, you've been on tour again, because I, I heard you were on CKWR not so long ago. Yes, yeah, yeah. uh-huh. I've had a few, yeah, interviews recently. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, interest in, in Blackberry Town is still up there. Yeah, well, it's uh, been um, about a year since, uh, where are we now? Yeah, the book came out just over a year ago. Yeah. A lot has happened yeah. in the past year. Uh, yeah, so I've done the main promoting of the book, um, but um, David Chilton, I talked to him at one point, uh, Wealthy Barber. Wealthy Barber, yeah. Yeah, and he said, oh, you can promote a book for two years. Yeah, up to two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's his well, theory. Yeah, on. he coached me a bit on sort of marketing. Uh, oh, really? But yeah, so I was grateful for that. Yeah. Are but, you working on a book now? I don't have any plans for another book at the moment. I... I'm not sure that I want it. This one took long enough that I, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to tackle another one. So no, the short answer is no. I do have a website. I try to write a blog, chuckhowitt.com. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so no plans at the moment for another book. But. And and what what are you doing with chuckhowitt.com? So um, basically that just includes my interviews that I've had about Blackberry Town, some background on the book, um, some photos, 
and my blog, which is um, basically, it's a mix of stuff sort of related to the book. The first blog entry is The Making of Blackberry Town. So if you want the backstory and how the book came together, uh, that's on my blog. And then it's just people I can find. Some of it's stuff from the book I didn't use, uh -huh. and others it's just people in the local tech community who um, I can talk into being interviewed. <laughs> it's a <laughs> bit just... of a challenge. It's different when you write a personal blog compared to a story in the record or the globe or on CBC that, you know, it's people are, I need a, it, you need a bit more persuasion to get them to talk. Yeah, you I know. just pulled up your blog on the monitor here. Yeah. And uh, the very first image is, is a, a very large picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bob, um, thank you. Yeah. Bob, uh, yeah, I did a blog on you and your work with free software and <laughs> Green Party. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope you gather all that stuff and, you know, maybe there'll be a chapter in the next book someday. Yes, yeah, yeah. Who knows what can happen. <laughs> you know what? The hour's up. Very good. It, okay. Uh, it goes quickly. It did, it yes. Did. So, we're talking to Chuck Howitt, the uh, author of Blackberry Town. Uh, how do people get a hold of you? How do, where is your book sold, first of all? Right. Uh, the book is available at, uh, it, you can find it at Wordsworth Books. It's available at Indigo Bookstores, um, Lorimer.ca. You can order it uh, from there, Amazon.ca, Amazon.com. It's available in the U.S. So it's fair, pretty widely available. If you go to any, you know, Indigo store, they'll order it for you if they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And Wordsworth I, have been very good to me, so... I had to put a plug in for them. Any plans on uh, publishing it as, as free culture, openly available for all to read? <laughs> uh, I haven't thought about that yet, but uh, somebody told me I should do an audio book. But oh, there's a thought. Yeah, it's more expensive and tougher than I thought, so I haven't well, done that yet. But. Come into the radio station, you know, grab a half an hour a day, yeah. and then uh, you'll be able to, to read it chapter by chapter, and we'll have some programming to put on the air as well. Oh, very good. Yeah, okay, I'll give it some thought. Okay. Chuck Howitt, thank you ever so much for coming in. Yes. It's been a great hour. Thanks very much for ever You're having very, me, Bob. You're okay. very welcome. I'm going to take us out with Peach and Quiet. Peach and Quiet happened to contact us through Twitter and said that uh, they were very happy that we'd been playing their music, so I figured it's about time we actually did play their music. This is Empty to Fill from their Just Beyond the Shine album coming out in January. I'm a sky full of doubt. Time to look on your face. You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections. My name is Bob Jonkman. CKMS Community, Connection, Community Connections is sponsored by Radio Waterloo. Executive producer is Jennifer Strong. Associate producers are Jeff Stager, Dylan Bravener. And on Saturdays, you'll be able to hear James Jordan, who does the uh, second edition at noon on Saturdays. See you next week.